All right, this is part five of my response to the gospel and social injustice by Dr. Russell Moore from the ERLC. Uh, hopefully this will be the last part. We only have about, let's see, six minutes left. Um, so hopefully he'll be wrapping this thing up and let's just jump right in. And what may be even probably the most horrific thing in the Naboth passage is the way that Jezebel uses God. She says, she has the, the witnesses say that Naboth cursed God and the king. So he was in violation of the law. He was in violation of the Torah, of the word of God. She's doing that. She's using God to carry out an act of social injustice. That's true. And God actually accounts for that in his law. So in other words, um, God's law, God's not naive, right? I mean, I know that that sounds basic, but it's true. God's law to the Israelites, the, the, the perfect law of justice that he gave to the Israelites, takes into account that sometimes people are going to lie to get their way. It takes into account that if you apply this law perfectly, sometimes people are going to get away with things. But uh, it, it gives you <laughs> law on what to do in those situations. If you have a false witness and you find out that they're a false witness, what whatever would have been done to the person that was accused of the crime falsely should be done to the false witness. Um, but also, even if somebody gets away with it here on earth, God judges them perfectly. So nobody gets away with anything. And so, yes, God's system of government, it has a high standard for evidence, a high standard for proving things, um, but nobody gets away with anything at the end of the day. God's not naive. He knows that sinful people will do sinful things, um, but we have to go by the law in order for us to be doing justice. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So you can't accomplish justice by ignoring God's law and then just saying, well, sinful people are going to sin. No, we realize that if we apply God's law, sometimes things aren't going to be perfect here on earth. But God gave us the standard for justice. We need to follow that. Like injustice. Well, that is something that certainly does not end with Jezebel. That's exactly what slaveholders did. It is to stand up and say God approves of kidnapping slaves from Africa and enslaving them as chattel slavery because of, and they were quoting passages of scripture that do not support that, but why? In order to have the imprimatur of God upon their acts of sin and injustice. Yeah, he's right about that. I'm glad he specified the kidnapping because really that was the primary problem with what was happening. See, slavery in the Bible is assumed uh, in, in all of God's law. God doesn't say it's a sin to have slaves. He doesn't say that ever in the Bible, so let's not pretend like he does. But kidnapping is condemned completely. And if you are found to be a kidnapper uh, and you're tried and you're found guilty, you get the death penalty for kidnapping. That is absolutely uh, something that we should apply in, in, in our justice system today. So the people that were uh, kidnapping the slaves from Africa, they should have been given the death penalty. There's no question about that, I think, biblically speaking. Um, so I'm glad he says that because they were abusing the Bible and we can go to the scripture and show exactly how they were abusing the Bible. We need to eat, be able to do the same thing today, to say, okay, well, someone who's against welfare, are they abusing the Bible? I don't think he can do that. I don't think people ever try to do that. Um, so that's the difference, but, but yeah, he's exactly right about that. People were doing that uh, during segregation to be able to say, well, uh, you know, uh, Acts 17 says that God has appointed the boundaries of our habitation. And so that means that God wants us to be kept uh, separate. Blasphemous. People do it now and say, well, uh, unborn children uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't matter because the, the life is in the breath. And until they are breathing, then they don't matter. They're using God. Interesting that he chooses an example like abortion, again, something we all agree on, because that's very easy to do. We can easily see how people who abuse uh, biblical texts to support abortion, and we can show them how they're doing it. I'd like to see the same attempt made for income inequalities and wealth inequalities. I'd like to see the same attempt made, because I haven't seen it. Well, actually, that's not true. I have seen it, and it's awful. Absolutely awful. Um, so Dr. Russell Moore, what would be very helpful is if you could show us in the scripture where it says part of the gospel is to eliminate income inequalities and wealth inequalities. 
that would be very helpful. It would be very helpful for us to see how part of the gospel is the fact that uh, we should eliminate uh, poverty from complete from existing completely um, in, in, in our societies, that, that the poverty itself is an injustice. We'd like to see that kind of stuff. We'd like to see this, the, the, the stuff for welfare as well and all of these kinds of programs. That's what we'd like to see. Um, but uh, yeah. In or- I don't, I'm not going to hold my breath for that one. In order to accomplish what is sin and what the outside world is able to see in all of these things is to say, you don't really believe what you say you believe. Instead, you want to prop up immorality or you're afraid of people who want to prop up immorality and so you're willing to sacrifice other people because they don't matter. I'm not sure what he's saying there, um, but uh, maybe he'll explain it. What, what difference does it make what happens over in the court of the Gentiles? We, we want to make sure that we maintain the sacrificial system here in the temple. Jesus says, my house is to be a house of prayer for all peoples, whether you think they matter or whether you think they don't matter. And then secondly, there's the question of uh, the gospel. What is the gospel? Elijah, in that Naboth passage, comes forward and speaks the word of God and speaks a word of judgment. Ahab has a certain degree of repentance, and so his, his judgment is is suspended uh, for a little while, but, but his dynasty is over with. In the same way that Jesus, when he's talking to that, uh, that lawyer, the, the question is whether or not I am justified before God, and Jesus is coming in here and exposing the ways that he is in fact sinning against God. Now, there are people who would say, well, this is a distraction from the gospel, and there are people who will say, well, anytime that you're talking about implications for, for righteousness in, in our social activities, then somehow you're involved in a social gospel. Well, when you hear that, you understand that people don't even know what the social gospel is. What the so- Yeah, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Um, but let's hear what he thinks of the social gospel is, and I'll probably agree, he's a smart guy, we'll see. The social gospel was, is to come in and say, let's not talk about individual regeneration that a person must be born again. Let's instead talk about reclaiming the structures and we don't have to worry about the the depravity and sin nature of people because once the structures are in place, the environment will automatically bring people up from from those structures. So it's exactly the same thing. That's very interesting. That's very interesting because I've, I've read from the Gospel Coalition founding document something that sounds very similar to that. Now, I'm not saying the, the Gospel Coalition doesn't understand the gospel of regeneration of souls and things like that. I, I know that they do. But one of the things that they said was the church will grow if you essentially reclaim these structures and systems of oppression uh, in addition to preaching the gospel. I don't think that that's actually accurate, uh, especially because we're Calvinists here, right? happen uh, anytime that you hear or, or often when you hear people say, oh, well, that's legalism. Is there legalism? Absolutely. The New Testament spends a lot of time taking legalism apart, but you will have often people who in the arena of personal morality uh, don't want obedience to Christ who anytime that any of the imperatives of Scripture are given, we'll say, well, that's legalism. That's true, and that's wrong and stupid. We don't want to listen to that. But really, one of the things that Jesus really hammers on regarding legalism is uh, things that the Pharisees were doing that made them look very holy, but actually overturns the law of God. And I would argue that things like welfare are exactly that. The welfare system that I'm pretty sure that Russell Moore wants us to support, um, that is one of those things. That's like the Corbin Law. Because they're saying, well, we're giving you the poor. We're, look, how, look at how holy this is. Jesus cares for the poor. We're supposed to give to the poor. And so we're supporting this welfare system that gives to the poor. Look at am- amazing. Amazing. But really, what I could say is I'll take you to the scripture and I'll show you how God says that's actually stealing. You're actually committing stealing and you're saying that it's holy. You're saying you're honoring God, but yet you're breaking God's law. That 
is an example of like the Corbin law, the Pharisees were doing. That's the same exact kind of thing, making up their own law, holding all Christians accountable to it, and then saying that that's very holy. That's not the case. That's legalism. That's legalism. And so if you're a Christian and you support these kinds of things, welfare laws and things like that, socialized medicine, all of these things, that is actually akin to what the Pharisees did with the Corbin law. That's breaking the law of God in an attempt to follow God. And I don't think that that works. In fact, I don't think it's an attempt to follow God. I think it's rebellion. I think when you support these kinds of things, when you support socialist types of activities, that's actually rebellion against God. And uh, hey, you know, that I, can, I think I can prove that scripturally speaking. Uh, I'd love to talk to somebody about this. We'll see if anyone takes me up. We, we don't want to talk about that because that's going to distract us from the gospel. So when you come in and say, husbands, love your wives. Well, don't, don't talk. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an unloving husband. I'm in Christ. And my righteousness is in Christ. Fathers don't exasperate your children. Well, I'm not neglecting or... Yeah, there's a lot of idiots out there. I'm not going to say a lot. There are some idiots out there that would say that. But the reality is the people that signed this statement and the people that are pushing back against Russell Moore's nonsense, they're not the ones saying that. Because I've seen tons of John MacArthur sermons where he explains, now that you're a believer, what is our responsibility before God? That's what Russell Moore's talking about here. And he's pretending like there are all these reformed people out there, these critics, that are saying, oh, we don't need to listen to God now that we're saved. Our, our righteousness is Christ. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying that. This is all straw man. This is straw manning to the nth degree. And Russell Moore, you got to do better than this, man. you got to do better than this because we're not talking about the anti-lordship people here. The people that are pushing back against you, for the most part, are not anti-lordship. I'm sure some of them are, but the big ones, the people who signed the statement, they're not anti-lordship and you know it. So why are you pretending as if they are? Because this is a bait and switch fallacy. This is a Mott and Bailey fallacy. You're trying to defend something that's very hard to defend, but instead you put forward this stuff that's very easy to defend and say, well, that's what I'm defending. No, it isn't. We're all saying we need to obey God. We're saying that we need to go to the scripture and find out how to obey God. And it's very specific there. And it's not doing what you're saying we need to do. I'm not a person who neglects or abuses my children, even though I do, because that's not me. My righteousness is in Christ. Flee sexual immorality. You see what I'm saying? This is all anti-lordship stuff that he's talking about. Who's the anti-lordship signer of the statement, Dr. Russell Moore? Point one out to me, and then I'll, I'll be with you condemning that. I'll be with you condemning that. Point one of the original signers that's anti-lordship. I'd like to see it. Well, I know I'm sleeping with all these people, but I'm not sexually immoral because that's just my body. I am in Christ and that's who I am. And don't distract me with legalism. Ugh. That's not legalism. It is the call to ongoing repentance and obedience. And the reason this is so significantly important is because the scripture is dealing repeatedly with issues of sin and the question of accountability on judgment day. Slave holders stand before God on judgment day. The sexually immoral stand before God on judgment day. People who are applauding the grinding of the faces of people into the ground because they're poor or because they're black or because they're migrants or because they're unborn or because they're fill in the blank. Do you hear this rhetoric? Do, do you hear this stuff? How many people that are on the, my side of this issue, the people that are pushing back on this stuff, how many of them are applauding grinding the faces of the poor because or, or the black just because they're poor and black? How many people, I could probably count on one hand, the people that I've met that advocate for that kind of stuff. Do, do you see what I'm saying? This is all, it's, it's very disappointing. It's very disappointing that, that Dr. Russell Moore thinks this is somehow of substance regarding this debate. So This is very disappointing because there's two options here. He's either lying through his teeth he knows that Dr. MacArthur is not one of these guys. He knows that Dr. White is not one of these guys. Tom Askell, Michael O'Fallon, uh, 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 Daryl Harrison. He knows that none of them are anti-lordship. Or he's completely ignorant. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so he just puts this out there in ignorance. There's one or the other. He's lying or he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because none of us would oppose what you're saying here. None of us would oppose that. And to pretend like the people that are on 
uh, against the social justice movement in Christianity are 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 this that you're accurately presenting their viewpoint is shameful is absolutely shameful and you need to repent before God because you will stand before God on judgment day for this kind of stuff you see what I'm saying <sighs> got mad <laughs> let's listen this one last minute I'm gonna calm down let's do this answer for that at judgment and you can't simply say well that's not me that's just that that was just my public life any more than you can say hey i'm personally very very moral oh, i stay very very faithful to my wife what i do owning the strip club or what i do owning this uh, pornography site is that's simply about my job that's my that's my vocational life Goodness don't gracious. it's a distraction for you to talk to me about vocational righteousness when instead you ought to just be talking to me about the gospel. Nonsense. This is why we need to have interactions. It's over. I'm ending it right there. I don't want to hear the music. I don't care. This is why we need to have conversations because this monologue is completely ridiculous. If he talks to even one person who's, who signed that statement, man to man, person to person, that person would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm with you on all that. Let's actually talk about the real issues here. The real issue is about how do you define justice? How do you define social justice? That's the real issue. We're not talking about anti-lordship stuff. We're not saying that your public life doesn't matter. We're not saying that your politics don't matter. In fact, we're saying that all of that does matter. But you have to define it very specifically. You have to define it carefully according to Scripture. You can't break God's law in order to keep God's law. That's what the real issues are. But Russell Moore's pretending like all the people that are that are that are supporting this social justice thing. Well, yeah, they're just running around saying, well, you know, my social life doesn't matter. It's all about my personal piety. <sighs> I don't even know if I want to do part two. I mean, that was just so poorly executed. Guys, if you're on Russell Moore's side of this, you got to do better than this, man. You got to do better than this. Because this is the thing. Like, this is what this is what makes me a little bit perturbed, angry, you might say, is that in general, my side of this issue is willing to be a little bit more nuanced here. I'm not judging motivations of the heart. I'm not accusing people of heresy, things like that. In fact, the signers of the statement went out of their way to say that. The other side absolutely is, because if you're not a lordship guy, if you say your life doesn't matter, your social life doesn't matter, that's pretty close to heresy here. Do you see what I'm saying? That's that's judging the heart. That's ju And people do this all the time. They say, oh, you know, I like the statement, but uh, it didn't come from a loving place. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know that. You don't know that because you're judging the heart, not the words. I haven't done that. I don't say you guys have bad motivations. I say, I think you think you're doing the right thing. You're wrong, and here's how I can show you you're wrong, but I think you think you're doing the right thing. Now, I have my suspicions about certain people that I don't think are ignorant. I think that they know what they're doing. I think that they're doing it for evil. Um, but I'm not going to say that publicly. I'm not going to say, oh, the signers of this statement, they're all evil. See, this is the problem. We've got people that are that are saying evil, slanderous things. Oh, white supremacist, racist, John MacArthur's a secret racist, things like that. And then some of us on our side say, hey, yeah, that you shouldn't do that. That's that's wrong. That's wrong for you to do that. In fact, uh, that comes from critical theory and things like that. that. That's why you feel comfortable doing that. Somehow we're the bad guys for calling it out. You know what? I don't feel like a bad guy for pointing out when Dr. Eric Mason calls me an angloid on the inside. So you can try to shame me, it's not going to work. You can try to call me a white supremacist, uh, even though I'm not white. You can do all that stuff, it, it's not going to work. So keep it up, it making yourself look foolish, and uh, I think you're giving us the high ground. I think Jamar Tisby gave us the high ground last week when he did that Avoid Them article. He said, hey, treat, treat these people like unbelievers. Shun them. Avoid their podcast. Don't share their stuff. You know, and I know they've been helpful to you in the past, but shun them. I think you gave us the high ground. And so that just encourages me to keep going. And I think it encourages a lot of people that haven't been speaking about this yet. I think it encourages them to speak up because they see the division that you're sowing. They see it. And they see this kind of stuff, this straw man fest that Russell Moore did uh, in this podcast. And they see it and they say, you know what? I need to start talking about this. So anyway, uh, yeah, you can keep having your monologues. You can keep burning straw man all day long. But smart people, God's people will see this for what it is. It's nonsense. Anyway, that's the end of that. I hope this whole thing was helpful. We'll see. We'll see. If you comment uh, in the in the in, and share this uh, enough times, uh, maybe I'll do part two. 
take a uh, you know I'll, maybe I'll uh, I'll uh, have a nice calming drink like some maybe chamomile tea or something so I don't go off the deep end but hey if you like this and you found this helpful comment in the comments below share it and uh, hey maybe we'll do part two I hope this was helpful God bless